Welcome, everyone. I invite you all to take your seats. We are about to begin the ceremony very shortly. I have the very difficult task of giving a few uh, technical announcements before we start. Um, first, I will ask you all to turn your phones off and, if possible, to keep them away. This is also valid for our dear speakers. Uh, if they can keep their phone away, that is very appreciated. Um, regarding the prize giving ceremony, uh, you are asked to stand up if you are a prize winner, but do not come to the stage. You stand up, your fellow students will appreciate and clap for you, but you are not coming to the stage. There will be um, a photo, little photo up with your thesis sponsors if you are a winner at the very end, at the entrance of the, of the concert hall uh, where, where there was the sponsors uh, registration desk. For the for the laureates of each department, uh, you will have uh, the task to find your director of studies at the end of the ceremony. Uh, they will have a little uh, gift for you. Uh, you can find them either at the end of the ceremony or at the reception uh, before you get too many drinks. Um, and I think that is uh, most of the information. Of course, we are heading directly to the reception after the ceremony uh, in VE, where uh, the facilities team has prepared a very nice reception, and there will be also a little concert from uh, your fellow students. And that is almost it for, for the logistical announcement, but there is one uh, special announcement uh, for, for this uh, ceremony. Uh, before I hand the, the, the mic to our official MC, uh, Rector Mogherini. Uh, there is someone that needs to be thanked, someone who has organized um, ceremonies at the college for over 23 years, if I got the, uh, the information right, and it's someone who's going to um, leave us soon. So I invite uh, Rector Mogherini to give a few uh, thank you words. Before, before we start the ceremony, so this is not yet uh, uh, the opening, I'll tell you a few words uh, in a moment. Uh, we collectively thought that this is the right place and the right moment to thank uh, Angela O'Neill that has been uh, uh, organizing ceremonies, opening, closing ceremonies, and also our communications for more than 20 years. If I'm not wrong, the first guest speaker, keynote speaker, was Giscard d'Estaing. So Angela, please join me on stage for being thanked properly by all of us. This is a little bit of improvisation. I think we have the music first. Yes. <laughs>
I think there is no better way to open uh, a closing ceremony, uh, a graduation ceremony. And if you allow me, uh, I think uh, we would all like to dedicate this moment of beauty that you have uh, shared with us to your own country, Ukraine. That is also the country that is in our hearts today, and it has been and it will continue to be uh, in our collective thoughts. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is uh, also a way of honoring uh, the people of Ukraine uh, for the beauty of the fight they're carrying on uh, this, uh, unfortunately, this, uh, these years. Uh, this is... And let me say how proud we are always to have Ukrainian students among us, always. Also, we are all happy and honored to have uh, uh, students from more than 50 nationalities. Uh, it is a little bit strange to talk about this a bit impersonally, looking at you, uh, because now I feel after these uh, months we've spent together uh, in Bruges uh, to know you personally, and I think that I do know most of you personally, having, converse, having had conversations and uh, shared moments in this, uh, in this last year. Um, let me, uh, though, start with a big uh, welcome and a big thank you. Uh, first and foremost uh, uh, to our keynote speaker, our guest of honor, Sigrid uh, Kag, uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Prime Minister of the Netherlands and uh, Finance Minister of the Netherlands. I think I can say something politically incorrect, but probably when I was in politics in Italy, I would have never imagined to be such a good friend of a Dutch foreign, uh, finance minister. <laughs> it shows that uh, things change. Uh, I'm particularly happy and honored to have you, Sigrid, with us uh, uh, this afternoon uh, because uh, beyond uh, the role that uh, you are institutionally playing uh, today in your country, uh, you are uh, an amazing, uh, inspiring figure, I think, for uh, everybody that has an interest and a passion for public policy and uh, improving the state of our societies and the world. So but it is not for me now to introduce you, but just to share with you that uh, I think we met for the first time in Lebanon, it might be so, so uh, it, it, we come a long way and I'm really grateful that you're here today because I think that uh, uh, it uh, would be very inspiring and, uh, um, and would leave to our students a very good sense of uh, direction, um, hearing from your um, words in, in a moment. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us uh, and I'm really happy that you're here with us uh, today. I would also like to thank and welcome uh, the mayor to whom I would like uh, to give uh, the word in a moment. Uh, for being with us today, but also for uh, his warm uh, welcoming and uh, uh, for his warm um, support uh, to the college and to this promotion. You all have now, uh, well, it's actually your mayor now, uh, as you have become honorary citizens of the city of Bruges. Um, I would also like to thank uh, all those that are supporting the college, our sponsors, uh, uh, all those that are providing prizes and awards, but also are supporting uh, the college in many other ways that are with us uh, uh, today. Um, I would like to um, welcome and thank uh, all our guests, um, hosting families, uh, uh, your guests, uh, parents, uh, partners, uh, family and friends. I would like to thank the faculty and the staff of the College of Europe for another amazing year together. Uh, and uh, most importantly today, I would like to welcome and thank uh, you, the students, uh, for this uh, uh, day of uh, celebration and accomplishment. Uh, this is your day, and uh, I'm not going to give speeches. This, this is all I have for today, so don't, uh, you don't have to worry. No, no emotional uh, quotes of Sassoli this time. <laughs> but but I, I couldn't help thinking back uh, of our first days together in Bruges when you arrived uh, in September when we first met uh, in room E. Uh, and we were sharing a bit of thoughts on how the year would have looked like. Uh, the first impressions, expectations, a little bit of anxiety also. Probably in many of your minds there was this idea of, um, okay, I made it to get here, but now what is this? Uh, well, now you know what it is, very intense. Uh, but I, I want to share with you one thing that uh, um, it, it's a little secret uh, uh, of, um, uh, of this uh, year. Uh, all uh, along the months, uh, in the first semester and then still in the second semester, um, when we were talking about how is the promotion going with faculty and staff, colleagues, uh, 
uh, from the very beginning, we started to say, so far, so good. Crossing fingers, let's see how it goes. And I think we can come to the closing day still saying, so far, so good. <laughs> You've been, I think, an exceptionally uh, wonderful promotion. Uh, and uh, I have uh, a little hope that uh, your patron has probably inspired you uh, with his uh, dedication, his commitment, but also uh, his uh, strength uh, and smile. Uh, you've been, I think, uh, uh, a wonderful mix of uh, academic uh, focus. Uh, I think, well, you will see that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I want to spoil the party for everyone, but in general terms, uh, uh, this is a promotion that has, uh, uh, has a very good uh, uh, average of uh, academic results, uh, and also uh, it's a promotion that has uh, proven to be extremely um, dedicated to the college life uh, with a perfect mix of uh, commitment, activism, but also constructive attitudes, and I think have had always the feeling that you have taken care of each other, you have uh, taken care of the common good of the college community, uh, and you have acted both responsibly and, uh, uh, and in a very uh, mature way, uh, but also having uh, some fun and uh, building the bond among you. So I'm really proud of you, and I wanted to start this uh, uh, celebration this afternoon sharing with you this feeling that I am sure the entire college community uh, shares with me. So a big applause to you because you concluded a wonderful year. With that, with that, uh, I will. Uh, uh, it is my big privilege and honor to give the floor uh, to our beloved mayor. Uh, and after his speech, you, you will have a message from the vice rector that is uh, uh, then uh, organizing the closing ceremony in Natalin tomorrow. Mr. Mayor, thank you once again for joining us. Mrs. Uh, Rector, Mevrouw de Minister van Financiën van Nederland, dear uh, Vice Rector, professors, collaborators, students, or should I say graduates, yes, uh, or should I say dear inhabitants of Bruges Honoris Causa. Dear parents, friends, and dear guests here in our most important and magnificent uh, uh, concert hall, we are very glad to meet you again. Although it's uh, not so long ago that I met the graduates, it's only this week we drank together in uh, Brussels, or more than one Brussels, yes? Mm -hmm. But... Um, Ladies and gentlemen, for the past year, our city has been the home of the students, now graduates, of the David Sassoli promotion. It is a tradition to wave goodbye to these young graduates after they have successfully completed their studies in our city. It is a great honor to, for me as mayor to be present during this closing ceremony. But I have to apologize, but I have to leave very early because I have to open with a Flemish minister, also Minister of Welfare, a new residential care center here in the city. Dear graduates, I hope that your time in Bruges was unforgettable, that you enjoyed all that uh, our small, large city has to offer. I say small because, you know, everything in, is within biking distance in Bruges, but Bruges is also a large city in world fame and in its ambitions. And I hope you also got to know that, that side of Bruges. I see before me a great group of enthusiastic, committed group of young people who are ready to spread their wings. One by one, you are ambassadors for the United Europe. Wherever the wind, the wind takes you, I hope you will be able to fulfill your dreams and that you will be part of a Europe held together by strength and stability. The European Union has faced many challenges in recent years, such as the Corona crisis and the current war in Ukraine. 
The very recent migration deal between the member states is also causing division and we have to be able to work together on climate and other environmental issues. Challenges are there to be tackled and the best way to do this is through cooperation. The experience and knowledge you have gained during your studies will give you the chance to tackle challenges with reason and with compassion. I wish you all a successful and fulfilling career, a career that will make you grow, not only as professional, but also as a human being. Always make, make wise choices and keep solidarity in your heart. I hope you will fondly remember your time in our city. And I also hope that you have made friends for life here. Bruges is a very kind and hospitable city and you are always welcome to return in the future. Thank you very much and goodbye. Dear Rector Mogherini, distinguished guests, and dear students of the David Sassoli promotion, congratulations, you have accomplished it, and it is time to celebrate your achievement. But this is not the end. The College of Europe is not simply the 10 months you spent here. It is not even the diploma. The College of Europe is a lot more. It is a perspective that you gain through the academic, personal, and professional experience you lived here. It will all serve as your compass and will lead you further. No matter what the major focus of your studies was or what program you followed, because the college, like Europe, is an idea. Equipped with knowledge, skills and friends, you can chart your way into the future and go as far as you wish. Add your unique mark to bringing a better future for your countries, for Europe and for the world. All the best.
Deputy Prime, Deputy Prime Minister Kaak, Director Mogherini, Mayor de Fau, Director of Studies, Distinguished Guests, Academic and Administrative Team of the College, Dear Students, This year has been intense and challenging, both academically and personally. But we succeeded together, showing great solidarity and a strong sense of community. In a few days, we will say goodbye to our campuses, residences, and of course to our classmates who have become friends for life. Nevertheless, beautiful as it may be, this year is only the beginning of our professional life, which I am sure will be rich and fulfilling for all of us. This future life will also certainly be demanding. The European Union is today at a turning point, giving us the opportunity to create new opportunities and to set new horizons. In this perspective, the word of our patron de promotion, David Sassoli, that has guided us during this year, must continue to echo in our minds. Don't be elites. Be leaders. <clears throat> Beyond understanding the world that is surrounding us, the challenge is above all to know why we are acting. Being a leader requires conviction, courage, and commitment. Madame la Première Ministre Kag. À travers votre parcours diplomatique, vous illustrez parfaitement cette citation. Vos convictions et engagements exceptionnels au service de la paix dans le monde font de vous une leader. Les différentes missions que vous avez endossées au cours de votre carrière au sein des Nations Unies, en particulier dans des zones de conflit, sont la preuve de votre ouverture sur le monde et de votre capacité à appréhender les problèmes géopolitiques d'une grande complexité. Pour ne citer qu'un exemple, le secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Ban Ki-moon, vous nomme en 2013 secrétaire général adjointe des Nations Unies en Syrie afin de mener la mission de déconstruction des armes chimiques. Votre leadership s'est aussi traduit par l'affirmation de votre vision politique au service de votre pays. En 2020, vous êtes élu chef du Parti démocrate 66 et vous occupez aujourd'hui les fonctions de vice-premier ministre des Pays-Bas. Après avoir été ministre du Commerce extérieur et du Développement, puis ministre des Affaires étrangères, vous êtes également devenue la première femme à occuper le poste de ministre des Finances. Ce riche parcours met en lumière la place, encore trop souvent contestée, que peuvent occuper les femmes dans notre société moderne. Votre présence parmi nous cet après-midi est donc un honneur, mais également une source d'inspiration pour nous tous, nous toutes. On behalf of the David Sassoli Promotion, I would like to thank you for coming to close the College of Europe Academic Years 2022-2023. Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. Well, I'll start with two thank yous. First of all, to Rector Mogherini, my friend Federica. Yeah, who could have thought when we met in Beirut, we'll meet again here in Bruges? But it's the B, and it's our friendship and our political like-mindedness. Thank you very much. It's a deep honor. And also, thank you very much for the kind introduction. But above all, students, parents, family members, relatives, lecturers, all of those who supported the students, it's truly an honor to address you today. It's a very happy occasion. It's happy twofold, of course. At least the second one I hope you'll be happy with. You've graduated. You will soon graduate. You will also enter the European labor market, armed, equipped, strengthened with your master's degree. And you'll be doing so at a very important time. At a time when the voice and influence of young people, of the rising generation, your generation, is sorely needed. Your knowledge, your commitment, your passion and your skills are badly needed. Because we're living in an era of change and I'm sure you've spent the whole year debating, discussing this. A world of shifting political dynamics which we have not felt in a similar way for a long time. 
new power relations. Perhaps they were there, but now we're affected by them and we're living it. And a planet that's calling us to a halt. A world of artificial intelligence, the new revolution. But in human terms, the most pregnant one, impertinent one, is the war on a European continent, a war on values, a war in Ukraine, waged against innocent civilians. And what role will you play in this world? What role will you play in Europe? And that question reminds me of when I graduated, and I'm sure I sound like many of the parents in this room potentially, decades ago, before you were born, I got my postgraduate degree, my first one in 1987. That too was a time of great change, but the contrast with today could not be greater. Nowadays, we suffer from acute labor shortages. And back then, I was very lucky amongst my friends to find employment. And in those days, we were saying any employment will do. It doesn't really matter. You've got one postgraduate degree, two or three. You're offered a job, just take it. Obviously, your task and your opportunity is significantly different. At the same time then, the European continent was filled with hope and expectation. After all, the Berlin Wall just fell and the end of the Cold War was inaugurated. The Western world was seized with new optimism and the historian Francis Fukuyama proclaimed the end of history. It's been much cited. Arguing that Western liberal democracy was the ultimate and final form of human government. With the United States as a shining example, and the only remaining superpower in a unipolar world. Countries would work together to bring forth prosperity, well-being, and welfare. And capitalism and trade would change the world for better. So we thought. And it's a worldview, then and now, seen through a specific lens, a worldview that very much depends on where you were born, how you were raised, and the rights you could derive from your, destination, from your destiny. And that's something that the political economist, an Egyptian political economist, Samir Amin, pointed out at the time. He warned against Western centrism or Eurocentrism, whereby the West sought to impose its own model on the rest of the world. And the rest of the world, of course, being a fairly big place. And over time, the West too saw more and more cracks appear in its worldview. And today, nearly 35 years after I first graduated, we are reminded we cannot take freedom for granted. And since Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February last year, we know we can no longer assume peace, security, and stability on our continent will prevail. And a reality, sadly, that many people elsewhere in the world have all too long been familiar with. They live in countries, areas, or regions where conflict, poverty, and human rights violations, often or sometimes of the grossest kind, have been a fact of life for decades, either neither addressed and certainly not resolved. And we've been forced to recognize that Western liberal democracy is merely one form of polity in a multipolar world, where countries with different norms and values are gaining influence. And although poverty and hunger have declined in recent decades, a trend, sadly, that has been reversed in recent years, Freedom House has for years been reporting a decline in global freedom and the state of democracy. Putin's Russia is aggressive and unpredictable. And we condemn that aggression in the strongest possible terms. China's position is strong and its influence is palatable. Climate change is already causing a trail of destruction and requires radical transitions to be made at great speed. And for me, ideally, Europe taking the lead. The current revolution in the field of artificial intelligence presents opportunities, but also calls for vigilance. These are all trends with far-reaching consequences. And individual EU member states have very little control over them. We might have aspirations, ideas, control, we have little. And this makes Europe and its narrative, as well as the European Union, even more relevant today than ever before. And it makes your choice 
of a career path dedicated to Europe in all its facets, more relevant and important than ever before. And the events of recent years, current and impending crisis we face, contain hard lessons, and it forces us to take a good look at ourselves. European un unity was born out of the vision that the most fiercely sovereign European nations could actually let go of their quest for domination, for power that they could pool their resources and power in order to survive, and finally to ensure that future generations would never again be robbed of their future and their prospects. It's a breathtaking vision, and at times seemingly appeared naive, idealistic, or impossible. And yet here we are. The European Union is in many ways a miracle, a miracle of human ingenuity, of conviction, of resourcefulness, of pragmatism, and often needed dogged persistence. It's just as much the sum of hard-fought compromises as it is the fruit of uncompromising devotion to shared ideals and, above all, values. This college was founded to encourage those who attend you to feel yourselves truly in all its facets citizens of Europe, and not by discouraging normal patriotic sentiments, but rather developing side by side these sentiments with a broader conception of European patriotism. And looking at the European Union as it is today, you may ask, what's not there to like or love? But it can't be forced by slogans, it can't be forced by advocacy or speeches. It has to be earned by results, by the changes we deliver for people often brokered at the national level by politicians or officials operating from a European perspective. And here's the catch. We don't always manage to deliver or we haven't delivered all we promised. But the events of recent years have opened our eyes to current trends. It's a fact that our economies are more vulnerable, perhaps than before, to geopolitical tensions. Are we able to ensure financial stability? Can we deliver on resilience? The pandemic exposed the vulnerability of our supply chains. But how do we address it? That's the question. Tackling climate change, I hear a very young voice. I understand. I would be bored too. <laughs> but tackling climate change is also for you, little one. It's more <laughs> urgent than ever before. The latest report by the IPCC could not be more alarming. And there too, how do we speed up action on this front? It's not to convince ourselves of the data as what we do with the data. Do we act? Do we see it through? And a strong Europe requires unity. How can we play a meaningful role on the world stage? And I certainly do not need to ask this question of, of, of the former High Representative Federica Mogherini, your very rector. And she knows like we all do, there are no simple answers to these questions. But we need to manage complexity. It's our task and it's our duty. And in recent years, we've seen how we can act if we want to with speed and unity, when we want to and when we have to. And the EU, or Brussels, in inverted commas, comes in for a lot of criticism. But ultimately, it ought to be criticism also directed at ourselves, directed at member states, us, because we, the member states, are the union. And the union has a significance in the daily lives of Europeans. The union can bring positive change in areas where our impact as a bloc is much greater than the individual states. For example, by the introduction of data protection laws, setting ambitious climate goals, and the list could go on and on. And next year's elections will be held again for the European Parliament and a new commission will be formed and it will set new priorities. So I hope you'll wonder in your own country, but also what does the Netherlands think is needed in this decade to make the Union stronger, more resilient and more unified? A resilient Europe which can play a truly meaningful role in the lives of its citizens and the world, operating I have to say this as Minister of Finance, of course, from a sound financial and economic foundation. It's in all our interest. 
A strong Europe, which can tackle the challenges of today, be ready for the issues of tomorrow, has the means and the willpower and the direction of travel as well as purpose. And so it can take its place on the world stage, not only in words, but in deeds. And a united Europe which shares in debate about our shared values, both internally, where it's needed, as well as externally. And today I'd like to share what I think about these three areas. First, a resilient union. That's to say, a union that can bounce back from adversity. A union that can develop, improve, learn, adapt. And that means we need to ensure a well-functioning internal market, a single market, healthy government finance, and a stable financial sector, as it needs to meet the requirements and needs of all our citizens. This is not an end in itself. It is a means to achieve our goals. And the well-being of our citizens, EU citizens, is not just about economic prosperity. It means equal access to affordable medicines, education, relevant learning, a healthy environment, and a way in which we coexist from a perspective of tolerance, mutual respect, and, of course, based on universal values. But what's more, coming back to financial and economic stability, this needs to be a source of strength to allow us to spread our wings also on a world stage. And the European Union can be resilient if it has its affairs in order. And the reforms, some of you who've studied this, proposed in the Economic Governance Review and the reforms to the Capital Markets Union, this is for the parents, uh, and the Banking Union will add to the foundations on which we will continue to build. And in current negotiations, which have only just taken off, we want to make sure that we make realistic agreements about economic governments, about how member states can and will keep their finance in order. It's important to have a realistic view on public finance, particularly at a time of continued pressures and expectations on what public finance could or should deliver for citizens, from energy subsidies to rising interest rates, from assistance to small to medium-sized enterprises during the pandemic, or to that much needed continued support for Ukraine. And of course, we would like countries to be able to reduce their debts. We'd like them to carry out reforms in the interest of their citizens. So they are resilient when times get tough. But we also need to look and allow countries with high levels of debt sufficient time to arrive at that pathway. By making sound, realistic agreements, we can lay a stable foundation. We can avoid unnecessary bickering, we can avoid divergence, and we can create convergence. And the single market can then help us achieve well-being, prosperity, and innovation, serving as a powerful weapon, peaceful weapon, in an economically turbulent world. And we're further strengthening our single market through the Capital Markets Union. This will make it easier for businesses to actually access funding for investments. So we do not look across the pond with envy. We can tackle our own problems because capital is available. And for consumers and asset managers to actually invest in the European Union. This will help finance and leapfrog the transition to a more sustainable and digitalized economy. It also makes us more competitive. All these are hard core economic and financial uh, building blocks. We need those. Steps have been taken, some of them positive and significant, but we need to act with greater strides, with greater decisiveness, if we want to tackle the challenges we face decisively. Because we need to remove the barriers to mobilizing private capital. And we are committed to help achieve this. We also need to make the financial sector more robust. Many of you will just look at re recent events in the United States or in Switzerland. The situation of many European banks has improved since the last banking crisis. But we need a European system of banking supervision. We need to ensure that the resilience of our system of our banks works. Because recent events have shown how fast and rapidly situations can change and we can act decisively. We need to reduce risks and therefore we need to complete the banking union. But all this depends on political will. Are we willing to go forward? Are we willing to build those agile and resilient economies? 
We've shown the ability to act in times of crisis. We've shown it since the start of the war in Ukraine. We have provided the Union in Corona times with unprecedented financial resources. And therefore, we need to continue to be sharp and mindful. And we believe that the midterm review of the multi-annual financial framework needs to focus on best and optimal use of existing resources so we can boost the digital and green transition that is crucial. But it needs to be achieved, it won't surprise you, speaking for the Netherlands, that we really hold dear the existing parameters. But special consideration is truly justified when we talk about our political, military, humanitarian and financial support for Ukraine. What's more, a new commission will need to have the courage to debate the political choices that have to be made. That means not only deciding on how, we'll how much money we'll spend, but which are the priorities, how we weigh them, how we balance them out, and also perhaps where we will phase out union money. Perhaps we need to focus, refocus, and sharpen our priorities. And that brings me to my second point, a strong union. A strong union is agile, strong in an unpredictable world. A strong union is innovative, ready to face the unknown, and to face future challenges. Thanks to the firm institutional foundations, both within the European institutions and every member state. And our European economy is a valuable asset in times of fragmentation. When trade came to a standstill during the pandemic, it turned out, it was very clear, we were too dependent on certain countries for medicine, critical medicine supply or equipment. And the war in Ukraine highlighted once more this danger. When it comes to strategic goods such as arms, vaccines and energy, we have to be able to stand our own two feet. Recent events have made that clear that we can and we must do it. This means we need to really build an open strategic autonomy. It also requires sacrifices and we need to be honest. It doesn't mean we need to turn inward and turn away from the world and nor should we be naive. We need to be aware that economic ties and exchanges may conceal other motives. We cannot view values and trade in isolation. And as I see it, this shouldn't be about deglobalization, but about re-globalization. World trade under certain conditions, against requirements. More strict, less naive, but also more attuned and aligned with people and planet. It's important, not just from a European perspective, we need to give other regions, other countries, people of this world, the chance to increase their prosperity, to truly benefit from inclusive and green trade. And where China is concerned, our approach remains the same. To be open where possible, to protect ourselves where necessary. The European Union views China, and I'm sure you've discussed this many times, as a systemic rival. That means we maintain our dialogue on security, fundamental issues of human rights, but we remain vigilant and we continue our engagement. China is also a competitor, and in recent decades it's secured an increasingly important economic position in global supply chains. This creates risks for European competitiveness, as well as reinforces further undesirable dependencies. And China is a partner. We need China, but China also needs us. We have to be able to build on reciprocal expertise, on each other's expertise, particularly when it comes to the climate and energy transition. This is a global responsibility. So let's approach China with self-assurance and the same self-assurance we can derive from our position as one of the world's biggest export markets. But when talking of China, we often speak of the global south. And I'd like to make a particular plea to actually encourage all of you from your different future roles to actively engage with the global south, wherever you are. The rest of the world is a big chunk of the world. The global south is needed and we need to dialogue, we need to invest, we need to truly understand in this new world how we can be a true partner to foster stability, generate investments, build true partnerships that are mutual and extend solidarity 
This was a, a very strong message at a recent summit for the new Global Financing Pact, an initiative by President Macron. Actually, the summit may still be going on at this moment, the closing hours. President Macron and Prime Minister uh, Mia Motley have teamed up because the Global South has been hardest hit by climate change for years. Whilst we may not, we still be debating it, people are living it in many places. And we need to acknowledge the concerns of the Global South and we need to deliver on solutions. It is within our means, it is within our power, and we can do more. We need to collectively support developing countries to be able to undergo the green transition, collectively find ways to adapt the multilateral system so it really fits to their needs, that we finance and we mobilize, particularly the resources from the private sector. All these are actionable deliverables, because climate action is only possible if we put all our shoulders to the wheel. We are not on track to meet either the Sustainable Development Goals, neither the, the SDGs or the 1.5 degree Paris goal. And we will not catch up unless we act in concert. We need to speed up and intensify our efforts. This is also the clarion call to my mind for your generation. And I belong to the last generation that can be part of the right steps in the direction of solution and resolution. And anyone who claims that enough has been done or let's only focus on our domestic issues is not telling the true story. Only one planet, one humanity, shared responsibility, and it comes with accountability. So it's our duty to back up that ambition with effective action. The global south will not be served Humanity will not be served by empty promises, let alone delays. So together we are working to create a future where clean energy, biodiversity and sustainable consumption are the norm, so we can halt climate change. And the European Commission is fortunately taking also here an active role. And as a Minister of Finance, I call, I engage, I meet with the financial sector because this ought to be a core deliverable also of all ministers of finance. I'm also doing this together with the Minister of Finance of Indonesia, where we co-chair a global coalition of ministers of finance for climate action. Because without finance in the room, we can have great aspirations, but you need the means, the system, to also enable the change. Because the bulk of the much needed investments to be able to go from billions to trillions needed to combat climate change for people and planet is needed from the private sector. Banks, pension funds and insurers have a critical role to play. They can decide where and how the money flows. They have a big impact and it's important we continue to call on them to contribute to both the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the Paris uh, Accord. It has to be clear that more action is needed. And a strong Europe in this regard is also prepared for the future, for geoeconomic shifts, to deal with climate change, and of course to ensure technological innovation. And in that regard, the Union has a good track record. It's shown the boldness to be able to make the bold move to invest in future technologies, but also to regulate where technology transcends borders. At present, of course, artificial intelligence, the sheer revolution that artificial intelligence is presenting us with, is advancing at a, at a speed and a pace that is probably outpacing most of us. And I assume your master's thesis was not yet written by using chat GPT. I'm looking at the rector. Uh, perhaps you have some uh, guidelines. And this speech, neither. But how can we tell what is fake and what is real? What's the value we attach to authenticity of human thought, of creativity, of ingenuity? And disinformation and cyber attacks are influencing the public debate in this regard. Artificial intelligence has, of course, it goes without saying, tremendous potential, but it also needs to be held in check by robust frameworks. And we need to be alert and we should anticipate its social and economic impact which jobs will disappear, which new jobs will be created, how work and leisure is divided, who can participate in the workplace, whose space, who's left behind as a result of change. So let's act in time, do it in a thoughtful manner, 
and do it in a rightful manner. But let's not allow the fast change of artificial intelligence be something that's overcome us, that's happened to us, but that's something we can hopefully steer in the right direction. And we can set a global and digital standard. And it's fantastic that the European Commission has taken this challenge by proposing the AI Act, because that too is something you can only do properly at a European level, not at a national level. And finally, the union will only become stronger if we remain open to new member states that share our values and, of course, meet the conditions for accession. We support, the Netherlands, the prospect of countries in the Western Balkan joining the European Union, along with new candidate countries such as Ukraine, Moldova, and potentially Georgia. In the long run, it's essential for prosperity and stability that the rule of law is respected and that it functions in countries. And by properly supporting and preparing candidates for accession, we can ensure that the union not only grows in size, it grows in relevance, it grows in strength, and its ability to act has been reinforced. But at the same time, the European Union institutions need to be able to cope with a larger union. Can we cope? Isn't it time to scrutinize the European Commission's tasks and responsibilities is a question I have. Should the Commission simply propose legislation or should it have a role in the supervision of its implementation? If the EU, just imagine, were to expand to 35 or more member states, I believe the Commission must be given a stronger role, as in the case of the single market and competition, so that when legislation is proposed, adopted, endorsed, it's also applied and implemented uniformly throughout the Union. The next Commission needs to develop a stance on this critical matter, because until now, our efforts to grapple with the issue have too often faltered and we can't afford it. Because a resilient and strong union can only function from a position of unity. And that's not a 100% game. There's no such thing. Our strength also lies in our diversity, perspectives, culture, experiences. But a diversity underpinned by the Charter of fundamental rights of the European Union, which gives European citizens the right to equality and solidarity, a fair trial, freedom of movement, and other important protections, remains, of course, essential. European cooperation is based on an open and free society. But sadly, in recent years, we've seen this cannot be taken for granted in many places. Certainly not in Ukraine, where innocent men, women, and children are victims of war and aggression. But neither in Hungary or Poland, where the rule of law, the media, freedom and equal rights are under pressure. And not even in the Netherlands, my own country, where according to a recent report by the General Intelligence and Security Services, a small group of citizens adherent to extremist views reject the rule of law and contend, and this is more a citation, that the Dutch government is part of a global malicious elite willing or uh, able or seeking to control their lives. They adhere to conspiracy theories. And this is not only a matter that's happening in the Netherlands alone. And in his latest novel, Alcibiades, Dutch author Ilya Leonard Pfeiffer, many of you will have read him in translation, I believe, describes the, the decline of Athens' first democracy. He writes, and I quote, history rarely repeats itself in a blatant manner. But when the events are over, it often turns out to have performed an old play behind new masks and in updated costumes. It's not a warning. It's a warning not to regard democracy as set in stone. It basically says don't take it for granted. Democracies have come and gone, and sometimes when you least suspected it. If more and more EU citizens reject democracy, we must not shrug it off because we can't imagine any other form of government. Democracy is something we can never afford to be complacent about. And at the same time, I don't want to sound unduly pessimistic. Most Europeans are critical of their government, of their political parties, um, of, of the EU, and this is fair, rightly so. But they still cherish life in an open democratic society. 
And we've seen, though, what can happen in the world when a strong man gets his way. Collectively standing up for our values means taking action against Putin. Taking action against the territory and the violation of territorial integrity of Ukraine. Standing up for the human rights of Ukrainians at this very time. We're taking important steps, actually uh, at speed rate, in the military sphere at a European level. European countries are working together more and more closely to procure military equipment and support Ukraine in other ways. This is an example of the political will to act when we need to, and we need to sustain that and hold on to that. And it goes without saying, but I would like to underline it, NATO remains the cornerstone of our defense policy. This means we'll have to aim towards the defense expenditure of 2% of GDP, as previously agreed. And we'll have to stand on our own two feet more than in the past, because for too long, we've relied on the United States, our big brother and ally across the Atlantic, to stand up for our values. But we owe it to the United States, as a trusted ally, to put our own house in order. And if we are to reflect our values internationally through our words and deeds, it's important we speak with one voice outside the Union. And it is high time we abolish individual member states' veto power on foreign policy. Values that we, we proclaim must be respected elsewhere in the world must also be respected at home. EU fen funding needs to be spent properly and rule of law mechanisms need to be functioning effectively everywhere in the Union. Achieving unity in Europe and projecting unity to the world means we have to apply standards and show results. If we openly champion the principles of the rule of law within and outside the Union, we will promote confidence to of these institutions and perhaps also regain the trust and confidence of those citizens that doubt or have opted out. We need to boost citizens' confidence in the institutions in our collective ability to deliver for them. A decline in confidence in government, a decline in trust, in science, in institutions is a trend we are witnessing across the entire Union. How do we deal with this? I would like to give this to you as a very important question. How do we ensure that we escape the fate of Alcibiades and of Athens? And there is no easy answer, but this is your time. It's important to be aware of the differences, to understand that the European Union does not mean the same to the students of the College of Europe in, in Bruges as it does for families in the Romanian countryside who see their talented sons and daughters leave for Western Europe and sometimes get very little in return. The union might belong to us all, but it means different things to different people. The challenge, as hard as it is, with nearly 450 million European Union citizens, is to continue to listen to and engage with as many people as possible, with the protagonists, with the detractors, and of course, with those who are keen to support, we need to engage with all. Empathizing with others, what does it mean to you? Even with people whose lives are far removed, even in your own country, from your own, from your own ideals and aspirations, engage. And I truly hope you continue to bear this in mind as you start working for Europe. My graduation coincided with a, with a watershed in Western history, as I mentioned, the fall of the Berlin Wall, marking the end of the Cold War. We do not yet know how 2023 will end or how it will go down in history. Not at a time of détente, that's for sure. A terrible destructive war rumbles on, superpower rivalry is back, globalization and free trade are under pressure, protectionism and fragmentation are on the rise. But after decades of open world trade, this is not the time to hold up the drawbridge. It's a time for optimism in the face of adversity, a time of optimism about the European Union, about our values, about the resilience of our economies, about our unity, because there's a lot at stake. A time for new generations, young people like yourselves, working actively for more democracy, for climate action, for equal rights of everyone. College of Europe students, it's up to you, and I hope you are ready 
to move the world forward. But above all, one free piece of advice, do the work you enjoy the most. It's not the career advice maybe your neighbors, your parents, or your college advisors have told you. You'll know deep within what suits you, what you derive pride from, satisfaction, what gives you energy and passion. I know from personal experience that the pathway you choose is not necessarily the one the other would advise you to do. But follow your instinct, trust your heart, you're super smart, you've got the paperwork, so I would say, go get them, you're heading for a very bright future. And esteemed guests, every academic year, the College of Europe elects a patron of promotion. And this year, it was David Sassoli, we see him there, former president of the European Parliament, who died much too young. And Sassoli once, once remarked, Europe still has a lot to say if we and you will say it together. So the question is, what will you say? What's the story we want to tell? And what role do you find for yourself and create for yourself in this world, in Europe? The narrative is there. We need to keep telling it, act accordingly. A narrative of democracy against dictatorship, of freedom against oppression, of tolerance against intolerance, of sustainability, against pollution, but it only works if we continue to extend an open, inquisitive mind, genuine curiosity, and ultimately, always respect. Congratulations.
impressive. Congratulations uh, to our students. And uh, Sigrid, I think that uh, I can interpret uh, our students' uh, feelings in saying that this was probably a thank you note from their side to your advices and your contribution to their closing day here at the college. Because I think that uh, this keynote speech we have um, uh, listened to today uh, is uh, the perfect connection between what you have been studying in this year and probably also before and what uh, is going to be your life as of hopefully not really tomorrow, but Monday or maybe July or September. Take a break, it's important. Because I think that in your words, Sigrid, they have seen and they have heard why it has been so important to become knowledgeable, competent, smart, critical about so many European related issues. So I would like to thank you very much for having addressed our students, but also the entire college community today with this uh, remarkable uh, keynote speech. Thank you very much for this. And uh, as, uh, as uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Netherlands and uh, Finance Minister uh, is, I think, uh, an impressive, remarkable role model for all of us, uh, but maybe a little bit more for all women and girls in this uh, room and beyond. Uh, the same goes for uh, the next patron de promotion, for the next promotion. Uh, that has been announced already, uh, but as you know, it is a tradition of the college uh, during the closing ceremony to uh, indicate, uh, to show, to reveal uh, also the graphics, the image of uh, uh, what will accompany the next promotion uh, in the College of Europe for 23-24, and that is uh, Madeleine Albright, another great example of a great woman. Actually, a European refugee that became the first woman Secretary of State in the United States, keeping always a very European solid anchor. And it is my honor today to announce that uh, the opening ceremony of the 23-24 uh, um, promotion uh, academic year will be on the 3rd of October with the keynote speech of the President of the Czech Republic, Peter Pavel. And this honors me a lot. With this, I would now like to move to a very important part of our um, closing ceremony, of our graduation ceremony, and that is uh, giving the floor to someone that uh, uh, during the year has worked uh, very hard, uh, as all of you uh, I know, workload has been impressive, especially at times, but uh, there are some of you that have worked a little bit even more than anything, anybody else, because they have taken on their shoulders from the beginning of the academic year an extra duty, an extra responsibility. That is a way to serve the student body, but also the college community. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, thank the student representatives uh, very much from the bottom of my heart, because they have been not only representing you, but also they've been contributing uh, enormously and with an extreme dedication and commitment and serious approach uh, till yesterday, literally, uh, with the proposals and analysis uh, that they've shared with the uh, college uh, um, administration and faculty. They have played a key role in this academic year and I would like to thank them uh, really sincerely uh, from my personal uh, point of view but also from the entire college community for all the work that you have done this year and I'm uh, particularly proud of uh, uh, the task that you have carried out uh, during this year. And this is now their moment uh, to wrap up the uh, academic year from their perspective, probably share with you also some messages about what uh, they would uh, like to see you collectively uh, going forward. Uh, so please Dear, college, uh, dear student representatives, join me on stage and the floor is yours. And thank you for what you've done this year. Deputy Prime Minister Kag, Rector Mogherini, Directors of Studies, Members of Staff, 
distinguished guests, fellow students. Congratulations, everyone. We did it. We survived a year of Saturday morning classes, a year of never-ending WhatsApp groups, a year of course evaluation forms, an year of perhaps a little too many Fritz and Brugze beer. For this past academic year, Brut has been our home away from home, where we studied, we partied, we met friends and partners for life. To live in this small, beautiful city in the northwest corner of Belgium means not only do we live in Europe, but we truly live and breathe Europe itself. This year, we come from 46 different countries from all around the world, and the friendships we forged transcended those boundaries and brought down barriers of language, of background, and of culture. Brew students, since time immemorial, have a name for this. We call it l'esprit du collège, and it was in full force this year. The college is known for its high standard of education, but such a standard cannot be reached through textbooks and PowerPoints alone. It is an education that you can sometimes find in the most unusual of places, in a chat with friends in the canteen, over a cup of coffee at the novel, or at one of the many student events and debates held throughout the year. Learning from one another and exchanging our cultures, languages, and ideas proved to be just as important as our academic studies. And it is with this international mindset that we are truly united in diversity. Another aspect of this college spirit is the solidarity shown by students towards one another, whether it was a personal setback or a national tragedy. Students showed immense compassion for each other this year. The new student-led initiative of the welfare bodies, organized by the mental health representatives, built on this inherent kindness among Sisolians, and in collaboration with the fantastic Student Affairs Office, um, organized a multitude of events designed to improve student mental health. Not only did we learn from one another this year, but we welcomed a record number of high-profile guests, from Borel to Blanchet, from President von der Leyen, to President Michel, to President Metzola, a trifecta of presidents of three major EU institutions. And of course, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. In many ways, the Bruges bubble is real. We occasionally live in our own little world of deadlines and college events and national weeks. However, Russia's illegal and unjustified war against Ukraine has forever permeated our Bruges bubble and its political, economic and moral salience gives a context to everything we studied and strived for at the college this year. When President Zelensky spoke to us that cold January evening, he spoke of his wish to emulate the College of Europe for Ukraine and invited us to help Ukraine integrate further into our common European family. Fellow students, we have a moral imperative to help our Ukrainian friends on their path to EU membership, and we must keep this in mind for our future careers. Ukraine is Europe, and Europe is Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Between all of the high-profile guest lectures and parties, we did also have to sometimes study. In academic life, the students of the EU International Relations and Diplomacy Department were guided by a world-class team. I would like to thank Professor Gustul, Professor Schunz, our fantastic team of academic assistants, and all of the staff and faculty of the IRD department. Their academic support and openness to new ideas is something we are all very grateful for. Fellow, <laughs> fellow IRDers, 
This has been one of the most interesting years in college history to study EU external action. We engaged in an intense simulation game, learning firsthand the intricacies of EU crisis management at the Foreign Affairs Council, only to see our Council conclusions replicated by the EU only a few weeks later. We went to Geneva, where after a 12-hour bus journey, we were given the unique opportunity to attend seminars at the UN, WTO, EU delegations, and more. We were also the first promotion in history to study alongside professional diplomats through the European Diplomatic Academy. We learned from, we learned from them, and they learned from us. Many of us made contacts and built networks that will launch them further into their diplomatic careers. We even ate the same exquisite canteen food. <laughs> Some... Uh, something that neither diplomats nor students were particularly happy about when we were served canteen pizza pretty much every Saturday of the year. Of course, a final highlight for IRD students was that most of us finished our exams a full two weeks before the rest of the promotion. <laughs> We've all heard the club med jokes that IRD somehow have it easier than the other departments. And while untrue, <laughs> Club Med is a badge that IRD wears with pride. <laughs> so much so that some students took the Club Med title quite literally and did a post-exam academic study trip to the south of Italy. <laughs> Replete with Aperol spritzes and days spent at the beach, academic in nature, I'm sure. And so, the year has come to an end. No more swerving your bike to avoid hordes of tourists. No more olive tree and anti Zuha takeaway on a Sunday. No more bar nights organized by our heroic Barco. <laughs> but as the never ending torrent of SFS emails shows, <laughs> L'Esprit du Collège lives on. We will always remain part of this college, and the college will always remain part of us. Gurav Mila Mahagwiv, thank you. Dear distinguished guests, dear students, amongst all, stu the Paul students chose two German student reps. Yeah, probably because you were so expecting some funny jokes in the final ceremony. <laughs> Don't worry, rather than me telling you a joke, I thought it would be actually more timely to consult ChatGPT. And, and this was the result. You may decide for yourself. Um, a German, an Italian, and a Dutch person walk into a bar. And the bartender looks up and says, is this some kind of a you joke? <laughs> and, and the German replies, uh, don't worry, we'll split the bill evenly. <laughs> the, the Italian chimes in and says, uh, we guarantee the wine is top notch. And the Dutch person says, uh, we will make sure everyone will get home safe by bike. So, despite the fact that ChatGPT knows a lot about our national stereotypes, um, you may decide for yourself whether you think that artificial intelligence is more funnier than Germans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, dear students, we're looking back at 10 incredibly intense uh, months of studying, discussing, organizing panels, and even some people managing an entire bar. For sure, we had some parties, uh, as we used to call it, small gatherings. Um, Pierre from the SAO team was rightly concerned from the very beginning about these parties. On day two, we had a broken table. And to first college couple as well. It was really a magical moment and the start of a wonderful relationship with our security ward and Guido. <laughs> well, 
the variety of Belgian beer basically spurred our creativeness to imagine the European Union of tomorrow. We negotiated the European Media Freedom Act in a simulation game, which kept us busy for a whole month. Yeah. It actually left some people in identity crisis and co colleagues from the department with great curiosity. Because all of a sudden, your friend Max from Poe was introducing himself as the vice president of the commission <laughs> or a member of parliament trying to convince you to participate in a staged protest in the name of transparency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have examined politics from all possible sides. The simulation game taught us important lessons. First of all, how to bash your political opponents on Twitter. And this is a very basic advice coming from ICT service. You should always change your default password. <laughs> Otherwise, you might get hacked on Twitter. And um, yeah, so, <laughs> yes. Um, and the third thing, to be a rapporteur sounds really great, but you're doomed in, work, in terms of workload. And only because you're hungry, it doesn't mean that you're allowed to say no to everything. <laughs> when there's one thing that we learned in Poll this year, it was the fact uh, that whenever something happens at the European level, you can ask yourself three questions. Who wins, who loses, and who adjusts? <laughs> And we know there's only one correct answer to this, and I hope you learned as much about your nationalities as I did here at the college. Um, yeah. <laughs> During our study trip, we visited as many European institutions outside Brussels as possible in only four days, and we got to the bottom of the question, why actually are there two uh, locuses for one parliament? Again, you can ask yourself who wins, who loses, and who adjusts. We learned that to be European does not depend on the locus of some institutions, but on the ability to create inclusiveness around diversity, and language has, kind of a, has been a point in this. Another highlight of our college life has been the master thesis. And at this point, maybe the professors should cover their ears, um, because who thought we could write a master thesis in three weeks? Well, I can ensure us all, nothing seems impossible from this point onwards. Today we can thank ourselves for putting in all, the hin all in this hard work and literally never having a day off. Now, we can, uh, now this will lead us in, in wonder about at which odds this will actually leave us with our future employers. If there are some recruiters listening, while everyone else in Europe craves for a four-day week, we gladly dedicate our weekend and our holidays too. As you can see, the speech would not be from Paul without a political message. Today we celebrate ourselves and our achievements. But when we look around, we will notice that not all students are here with us today. And we should therefore reflect on, whether, uh, on where we should have done the most uh, to create a more healthy community. As young professionals, we are driven by our interests, our passion and fascination, but also by considerations of our future careers. However, other factors in life matter a lot, and some of which I see directly in front of me. Um, yeah, without our families and friends, we would possibly be not here today. We should therefore never put our career ambitions above the well-being of our own mental health, mental and physical health, um, and certainly not at the expense of others. And this is also about the adaptation of processes that affect us here at the college. David Sassoli, former president of the European Parliament and patron of this year's promotion, was a great promoter um, of change through practical leadership. Whether we look at the stage of world politics today, the war in Ukraine, but also challenges of energy transition and digitalization, 
or even at the microcosmos of our university, we can say that this year was a, full, it was a year full of lessons that we cannot put into a box, but that we can help us to understand how and where we can improve. And in the words of David Sassoli, quest'anno era un anno di molti lezioni che non dobbiamo mettere in un cassetto, ma che possono aiutarci a capire dove e come possiamo migliorare. On behalf of the Paul students, I'd like to thank, first of all, our department head, Professor Costa, the academic assistants that have been literally guiding us throughout the year, and the Student Affairs Office. Thank you very much. Enjoy the evening. Man, what a year. <laughs> Ten months ago, we started this incredible experience of studying, living, eating, partying together. And I feel like the opening ceremony was yesterday with the comment of President Mezzola about the 20 college weddings of a promotion. And it's true that many people fell in love here. I didn't. My mom told me this year would be my last chance to find a husband. Sorry, mom! <laughs> But yeah, let's not talk about me. It's true that the College of Love seemed to be a real thing this year. And I cannot wait to be invited to 20 college weddings and meet future college babies. Imagine all those future European leaders coming to the college in 25 years. And don't start with nepotism. We all know that college is for anyone. Anyone with 26 Ks or a very good scholarship. The start of this incredible adventure was for many our first experience in Belgium. As a Belgian, I have witnessed so many of my colleagues coming from warmer countries struggling with the Belgian weather. Come on, wind and rain for 10 months. Who wouldn't want that? But I think that all in all, everyone pretty quickly started to feel like home here in the bubble within the bubble. Many of you even started Dutch classes, proficiat. You all know how to ask for direction or order a beer in Flemish now. You are now officially Belgians. We have even been recently granted the title of Honorary Citizens of Bruges. And this despite the noise complaints and the police coming over a few times in the bar of GH. This is proof of how welcoming Belgians are, granting titles to noisy visitors. Those 10 months here have also been the occasion to learn about Belgian culture, as a Kentus, or Belgian cuisine, and I mean waffles, fries, chocolates, and beer. Every time the chef at the canteen told me that we were eating Belgian cuisine, I want to cry. No. Overcooked rice every day is not a Belgian typical dish. Speaking of food, I would want to congratulate Zoran and Emily, our two reps in charge of the canteen. Despite the epic fail of the As the Chef event, they have one substantial achievement this year. The pitchers of water on the tables. <laughs> we even got some fancy lemon slices at the end of the year. Thank you for that, guys. <laughs> All in all, I think that sharing fried food over 10 months brought us all closer together. Everyone is equal in front of the infamous bouillabaisse. <laughs> and the canteen seems to be a real place of unity and diversity. As I cannot only make jokes for five minutes, let's be serious for a moment. This year, we witnessed immense solidarity among us and beyond. The college has been a place to share our culture, but also to support others in difficult times. In response to dramatic events, students have organized different charities and fundraisers following the earthquake in Turkey and Syria, the flooding in Italy, and of course, the war in Ukraine. I want to thank and congratulate every student organizing and taking part in those initiatives. <clears throat> On
En tant qu'étudiant en droit, quand on échange avec les étudiants en POL ou en IRD, on peut avoir l'impression qu'ils sont les seuls à travailler pour l'intégration européenne. Après 6 289 pages de lecture obligatoire et 867 arrêts de la Cour, laissez-moi en douter. Le Collège est l'endroit idéal pour nous rappeler que le droit est à la fondation même du projet européen. Le marché intérieur, du droit. La politique extérieure, toujours du droit. Après un premier semestre à revoir les bases du droit européen, tout en liant sans cesse l'aspect juridique avec le processus d'intégration européenne, nous avons eu l'occasion de nous spécialiser dans des domaines de notre choix. Certains ont préféré se concentrer sur un domaine bien particulier, comme les competition nerds ou les traders du dimanche. <rire> D'autres ont préféré s'ouvrir à la nouveauté et se sont choisis un programme beaucoup plus varié. Entre les cours, les compacts séminaires et les diverses conférences, vous avez également tous brillé au mot de corps du collège. Félicitations à l'équipe gagnante ainsi qu'aux meilleurs plaideurs, mais également un grand bravo aux trois équipes ayant représenté le collège à l'international au concours René Cassin, au concours d'autorité de la concurrence ainsi qu'à l'EMC. Je m'auto-félicite. Une mention toute spéciale pour ma collègue Léna Marie Ziegler. <rires> pour avoir remporté le LMC euh, en tant qu'agent de la commission. Euh, L'aventure ne s'est pas limitée à Bruges, mais a aussi été l'occasion de partir en study trip dans une contrée beaucoup plus exotique, au prix exorbitant, le Luxembourg. La visite de la Cour de justice a été l'occasion d'une petite sieste bien méritée pour certains, mais a surtout été source d'inspiration pour d'autres. Divers événements de ces dernières années nous rappellent l'importance de l'état de droit en tant que valeur fondamentale de l'Union européenne. La récente procédure d'infraction engagée par la Commission contre la Pologne nous rappelle la fragilité d'un système de valeurs qui peut pourtant nous sembler acquis. Juriste aguerri, la formation que nous avons reçue à Bruges nous laisse aujourd'hui avec toutes les cartes en main pour être des acteurs clés de la société de demain. Dear colleagues of the Law Department, We all managed to squeeze two semesters of, the, of competition law in five days of study. <laughs> We all survived the internal market law class. We all felt like VIPs compared to the other departments when seeing the guest list for the career days. <laughs> We all know deep down that our department has the best academic assistance possible. Thank you all for this amazing year. Thank you to Professor Govar, our head of department. Thank you to the academic staff and the academic assistants. And thank you to all of the college staff working in the backstage. Congratulations, guys. Thank you for making us laugh, laugh sorry. Uh, I hope you have appreciated the jokes because this part may be a bit less funny. Let's talk about climate change. <laughs> I represent here the Eco Department. As economists, we love facts and numbers. So here are some. Nature is in crisis and is getting worse. More than one million species are currently at risk of extinction, with climate change being responsible for many of these situations. Limiting global temperature rise to no more than 1.5 degrees is necessary to avoid the worst climate impacts. Yet, the current path of carbon dioxide emissions could increase global temp temperature by as much as 4.4 degrees by the end of this century. Global model pathways that limit warming to 2 degrees involved rapid, deep and immediate greenhouse gas emissions reduction in all sectors this decade. The 100 least emitting countries generate 3% of total emissions. The 10 largest emitters contribute up to 68%. 
These numbers may sound theoretical and abstract. They are not. They have direct consequences and repercussions on our lives and on the lives of others at the extremity of the globe. What they say is that we are failing, collectively failing. Tackling the climate change and biodiversity emergency needs a paradigm shift. As one of the foremost academic institutions that prepares future leaders, European civil servants, policymakers, and we hope there are some future leaders in this room, otherwise what would be the point of such an expensive network, some may say. The college has a leading role to play in the social and ecological transition. Studying at the college is a privilege. Privilege entails responsibilities. All of us, as part of this college community, need to take on our responsibilities seriously. During one year, here in Bruges, we lived together, we studied together, we laughed and partied together. Through education and knowledge, the college gave us one of the most precious abilities, a certain sense of empowerment. This should give us the courage to change the statu quo and invent a new future. The college should prepare us to face the future challenges which are awaiting for our generation. And climate change will be one of them, if not the major one. To make our contribution and put words into action, we, students of the David Sassoli promotion, tried to bring more sustainability to the college community through several initiatives. The first initiative, not the most successful one, was the energy saving campaign, which was officially launched with Dmitro's speech during the opening ceremony. The main measure was to limit temperature at 19 degrees in all buildings in response to the energy crisis and in support to Ukraine. To enhance further energy saving efforts, between the stick and the carrot, we choose the carrot approach. We launch a resident challenge to award the residents with the largest energy saving performance. For the record, Biscayer won. And of course, I'm not saying this because I'm from Biscayer. To reduce our carbon footprint, another initiative was the Sassoli Veggi recipe. More successful initiative than the energy saving campaign. Thank you, Zorane and Emily. Even though apparently some of you are still traumatized with some of the Veggi meals. The canteen staff help, and I would like to warmly thank all of the canteen staff, the cleaning and the facilities staff, our residence warden, the library team, the student affairs office, on the behalf of all the students from the David Sassoli promotion, thank you very much. We tried. We did not completely fail, but we cannot say we succeeded either. This is not enough. This is a solemn call for all of us. Dear fellow students of the David Sassoli promotion, the kindest promotion, according to Guido, our most beloved night watchman, 10 out of 10.
Personally, I suspect he says this to each promotion. <laughs> this is a solemn call for all of us to take on our responsibility and to have the courage to challenge the statu quo. Si nous ne le faisons pas maintenant, quand le ferons-nous Et le temps presse. We would also like to take this opportunity to solemnly call for the students of the future Madeleine Albright promotion to take over what has been started and keep working with the college administration on how to incorporate the topic of social and ecological transition in all aspects of the college life, from curriculum to daily facilities. Let me finish with some words for the Eco Department. <laughs> cette, cette famille de cœur, cette famille choisie, and since we are kind of a family, we wish birthday, and today is Victor's birthday. Victor, cumpleaños feliz! is a small department with great potential. Let's remind everyone here that the Eco Department is divided into four tracks, because I'm sure that in the room some students are still not aware of this, and it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take this very, very, very last opportunity to clarify. In the Eco family, we have the Eco Eco Track, or Eco Squared Track, the Eco LEA, a strange mix of economics and law, the Eco EPA, one more strange mix of economics and politics, and the EIB, and it's still not clear for us what they are doing, <laughs> and I'm not sure it's clear for them neither. But apparently, well, they do business. <laughs> Dear Echo Fellows, even though we were the very last ones to have our study trip after many, many port visits, <laughs> even though we never got to see Moscovici, <laughs> even though we had to endure econometrics, chaos, numerous graphs, and many statistically and significant coefficients while writing our thesis, we had a great time. Comme dans toute aventure périlleuse, davantage que la destination, ce sont les compagnons de route qui importent. Et quels compagnons de route d'exception nous avons été Merci au département d'économie, à sa directrice de département, professeure Béatrice Dumont, à nos trois assistants académiques, Jeanne, Giovanni et Hugo. Thank you for the memes. <rires> Merci pour les rires. Merci pour les larmes. Merci pour tous ces souvenirs à chérir. Ceci n'est qu'un au revoir. Distinguished, sorry, distinguished guests, dear fellow students. It is now time to return to the experience of the promo David Sassoli of the College of Europe. I invite you now to embark on my side, aboard our train, to retrace the different stages of this year in different colors. 
You have sent your children to this institution, but do you really know what this entailed? <laughs> Between the French, who still think that the, ENA is, the college is the ENA of Europe, the Americans that are still looking for Europe's phone number, and all of us that are still trying to understand the famous and mystic meaning of European integration. It is important that you understand with which luggage we will soon leave Bruges. Premier arrêt de notre voyage, le 12 septembre 2022. Nous, jeunes et moins jeunes, naïfs et innocents, débarquons à Bruges afin de rentrer au sein de cette grande famille du collège. Nous venons rejoindre nos compères installés depuis déjà deux semaines et déjà enivrés des vices qu'a offrir la ville de Bruges. Bière, bière, bière. Mais ce premier arrêt, c'est prendre conscience de ce qu'allait symboliser cette année au collège. C'est la reproduction d'une société multiculturelle avec ses difficultés et surtout ses richesses. Mais c'est également la vitalité de croisements de cultures, de peuples, de langues et d'histoires. Le collège c'est finalement comprendre l'Europe à travers la grande histoire, mais également les plus petites, à travers les rencontres, les échanges. C'est cet immense carrefour du passé, du présent et du futur, en ce sens que nous, étudiants du Collège d'Europe, devenons aujourd'hui des passeurs d'histoire. On this train, the matter students are here today represent play a specific role in upholding and protecting the transatlantic partnership. This relationship has forged Europe the way it is today. After spending a year in Bruges, we will be fortunate, in, fortunate enough to spend a couple months in Boston to grasp the purpose and the depth of the bond that unites both sides of the Atlantic. A one-of-a-kind opportunity to enhance our mutual understanding and strengthen our essential cooperation to respond to current and also future challenges. As stated by Ursula von der Leyen last December here in Bruges, Since the end of the Cold War, never has transatlantic cooperation been closer than in the last two years. Bon. Between us... <laughs> Between us, Mata is also full of privileges. We are like the special ones of the college. Less exams, second year thesis, sorry guys or even private meeting with ambassadors. The true definition of a high-class college club med, ultimate honorific title for which all masters have been competing for this year. Parce que ce train, c'est surtout un héritage historique, mais je dirais surtout que ce sont d'abord des rencontres. Des gens qui se sont tendus la main. Et c'est assez curieux. Et c'est assez curieux de se dire que les hasards, les rencontres, forgent une destinée. Je vous laisse imaginer la scène. 342 étudiants, plus de 50 nationalités, 7 résidences et une cantine. Le but du jeu, partager au mieux sa culture nationale au sein de la communauté européenne. Penchons-nous sur cette dernière semaine de jeu qui a fait suite aux examens. Nous avons tout d'abord eu les Belges et leurs traditions surprenantes, comme leur cantus et ses incantations latines. Euh, mais aujourd'hui, il n'est plus un mystère pour bon nombre d'entre nous. Nous avons aussi eu les Italiens, leur soirée inoubliable, mais dont réellement peu d'entre nous se souviennent entièrement. <rires> Ou bien les Allemands et leur unique flanc qui bourreau, nécessitant une double endurance physique et éthylique. The college is finally the meeting place of people from different horizons that all share a common passion for Europe. A will to protect and defend its values, that is what brings us all here together in this hall. Defending these values was the purpose of David Sassoli's personal and political engagement. As he stated, the defense and promotion of our founding values of freedom, dignity, and solidarity must be pursued every day inside and outside of the EU. Before arriving, I would like to give a very special thanks to the professor, Professor Chang and director of the MATA program, to Jana, that is not here unfortunately today, and also to Belinda, who's been working with us behind the scenes. So now that's the last stop of our train today, 
June 23rd, 2023. I hope that all of you will have enjoyed the trip. We mark here the end of this journey, but also the beginning of new adventures that we will most certainly share together. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Merci à tous. Dear Rector, distinguished guests, dear students, dear friends, we are pleased to celebrate today with you from Natalin the end of this enriching and intense academic year. Congratulations, we made it! Despite the few kilometers that separate our two campuses, we recognize that this year has brought a unique and shared experience to most of us. From an academic, professional and personal perspective, we have traversed an extraordinary journey together. It was a real privilege and a pleasure to meet you on the occasion of the exchanges between Bruges and Natalin. We would like to thank you for your warm welcome and for the memories and encounters that have made our year together so much more memorable. We also hope you enjoyed the part of your journey spent here in Natalin. We sincerely hope that we can continue our paths together next year in Brussels and beyond as we embark on this new chapter of our lives. May it be filled with joy, success and unforgettable memories. Here's to a wonderful next chapter for all of us as we navigate the future hand in hand. See you around, Sassolis! Brennt mein Eingang.
Thank you. Let me thank again not only uh, the singers and the players, but also the student representatives for uh, not only their work, but also their wonderful words today and uh, for having represented you so well. Uh, I want to stress this uh, time and again. I promise you I don't have any speech, but I will keep telling you a couple of things in between. Uh, I'm a presenter tonight. Uh, this, uh, this day is somehow the closing of a phase, but it's actually not really the end of anything. It's a transition. Uh, we have not told you yet today, uh, so let me uh, say this now. This is not an end, uh, this is actually the beginning of something new. And uh, the next uh, speaker I would like to invite on stage uh, will tell you a lot about this, because uh, today as uh, we will approach, as we approach uh, the moment when I will declare the academic year closed, you will uh, transition uh, to, from your status of students uh, to your status of alumni of the college. And this is a new world opening up. You have uh, tasted a little bit of that already, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, I would leave uh, to Zoe, the president of the Alumni Association, uh, the rest of it, thanking her for the work she has done uh, in these last years that have also coincided with my tenure as a rector uh, as uh, she approaches uh, the end of her mandate next week. So I would like to have a special, special thank you for Zoe to... Uh, all the work she's done for the Alumni Association. Dear Rector, dear professors, families, students of the college, it is one once more great pleasure, and I'll try not to become emotional as this is my last speech as president of the Alumni Association. It's a great pleasure to be here with you in this extremely important day for all of you, but also for the college itself, also for us as alumni, as we get to welcome yet one more um, promotion in our family. I must say that I have attended so far, I think, four graduation ceremonies, including mine. This is one of the best ones. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> and. I have to say, although I wasn't at the echo department, if somebody was keeping uh, track of stats, I think this one would rank possibly the highest in terms of canteen jokes. <laughs> but some things never change. <laughs> the first time that I had the honor to be invited to deliver this speech here was in 2020 during COVID. The atmosphere and the experience for the students was, of course, quite different back then. Even the weather was quite different we can put it on climate change, of course. Uh, last year, things seemed to be almost fully back to normal, resembling much more my own graduation from the John Maynard Keynes promotion. But I have to say, every year I come back, it is always somehow both different and similar at the same time. And I cannot help but wonder, did my own promotion also feel so impressive, so full of energy, so ready to go and conquer the world as you do? I think, I believe that the answer is yes for every single promotion. I also recognize the feeling of nostalgia that you already feel, the overwhelming memories, but also the excitement for the future and what comes next. The experience is different for every single student, but with hindsight, I can tell you that it is a flagship moment in all of our lives and I have not yet talked to a single alum that as the complaints about weekend classes and canteen food fade away, does not miss it immensely. But as I always say, and as it has already been mentioned a few times, you may be leaving the college, but the college, college will not leave you. It will stay with you. With your graduation, you become members of something even bigger, as the rector already said, even stronger a community of more than 17,000 alumni. With this community, you will not only share internal jokes about residencies, canteen food, and uh, your uh, sim games. Um, and yes, it's uh, the identity crisis on the poll, the sim game continues, I can tell you. Uh, but you also share a common responsibility. I strongly believe the answer to everything that threatens our humanity today depends above all on whether our youth understands the degree of our responsibility, be it climate change, 
territorial conflicts, overpopulation, a boat with 600 migrants sinking in the Mediterranean last week. The world is in our hands. Let us not forget that the College of Europe was founded at a time when the entire world emerging through some, was emerging through some of the darkest times in our history. And with the purpose of educating the new generation about the values that would allow us to preserve peace and work together on a better future. So let us roll up our sleeves, for the future is in our hands. As part of the Alumni Association, the most rewarding part of this work now is when we see alumni coming back every year in our alma mater to pay tribute to this beautiful experience shared. Now I'm referring to our flagship annual events, the anniversary dinners. Only in May and June this year, we already had the pleasure of welcoming back to Bruges alumni who graduated, mind you, 10, 15, 35, 45, and 65 years ago. So just saying the college family is, uh, and the community is not, is not a rumor, and this proves it. And this would make essentially approximately 1,000 alumni that come every year back. No matter what the age, they always come back. And here, I take the opportunity to say a huge thank you to all the volunteers that contribute, all the alumni that contribute in their free time every day to the activities of the Alumni Association with the sole purpose of strengthening this community, including my colleagues at the board of the association. Of course, I would also like to say a warm thank you to Rector Mogherini. We started together, indeed, during COVID times. Obviously, I'm not going to share, but you, you know very well how you, there is an element of uh, behind my own application for the college, um, a funny event in Athens that uh, encouraged me to apply. And uh, so I consider this as I come towards the end of my uh, second life uh, at the college. Uh, a very uh, interesting and uh, nice situation where we are both here again. <laughs> so I would like to thank you again, and uh, I believe that your drive and motivation to connect alumni and students gave a new breeze in our cooperation with the college, which continues, I believe, stronger than ever. For that, I would also, of course, like to thank college staff, professors, for the excellent cooperation. Now, as I mentioned, having served for the past three years as president has been an immense honor, but uh, the, this journey might stop here, but once a college alumna, always a college alumna. So I'm not going to be too sad about it because the community prevails for life. But I also want to say that uh, there is a new board coming and the new president, Teona, and I think they have the same rigor, vigor and uh, passion to keep this community um, strong. And I ask all of you to join the Alumni Association, be it in Brussels, be it in other capitals, and uh, support in this, uh, in this mission of keeping us close. Dear students, to come back to you because this is your day. As you are sitting here today, richer in experience, knowledge and friendships, you must have understood by now what this college experience means and will always mean. And there is more to come. I could only reiterate what the keynote speaker, the deputy BM already said, do the job that you will enjoy. You will learn that later on as well. But keep always in mind that this feeling of family and community and the friendships that you build here at the college are one of the most important things that will follow you later on as well. They are a support system for you. Do not lose it. Work on keeping it alive. And we are there as alumni to welcome you. We are really looking forward to officially welcome you after you also hear from your professors as well and after you have com concluded with your, uh, all of your studies officially receiving your results as well. But for now, let me just congratulate you for making it through this year, an amazing year, I'm sure, but also a challenging one that we can always uh, all acknowledge. So you, you deserve lots of kudos for 
making it through and for being here. And honestly, so much more is coming. So I understand you feel uh, a bit sad, but feel also very excited and proud of yourself for everything that has been achieved and will be achieved as well. Congratulations, and we, will, we look forward to welcome you officially as well to the alumni community. Thank you. As we are for full transparency, and there is no secret at the college, almost no secret, uh, uh, let me unveil the little uh, anecdote uh, Zoe was referring to. Uh, it was a very weird uh, situation. Uh, I spent uh, a couple of days uh, during a Christmas holiday. What was that? 2017? Uh, 15, okay, 2015, um, in Athens, uh, and I was uh, just uh, uh, taking a, a bus with my daughters from the city, uh, from the center of Athens to somewhere else, and Zoe was there with a friend and just came to me and said, are you the HRVP taking a bus in the center of Athens? I said, yes, it's me. Uh, normally, I deny. <laughs> uh, in that case, it was so, such, a, such a nice um, uh, girl, and I said, yes, it's me, and it was the time, Zoe told me afterwards, when she was deciding whether to apply to the college or not, and she took it as a sign of being in the land of fate, uh, rightly so. And then we found each other again uh, here. So all roads lead to Bruges, apparently. <laughs> Uh, now, this is the moment uh, uh, that uh, many of you have uh, been waiting for uh, so much, uh, and that is not yet the party, uh, but uh, uh, the award session. And so uh, I will uh, uh, give the floor now to the Director of Studies uh, in order, uh, and uh, uh, we will be announcing those of you that have received, uh, received this afternoon uh, awards uh, for uh, their work. And we will start, on va commencer par uh, le département Paul. Donc, uh, je vais donner la parole au professeur Costa pour commencer cette séance. Merci. <clears throat> so, dear all, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, celebrate the end of the year, not because I'm relieved, because this year things went pretty well, uh, but just because it was a great year, and it was really, and the rector was right saying that we don't say that every year. We say nothing, but um, <laughs> we don't lie. Um, okay, I've been told that the Paul students already left because it's too hot and too long, and they're already getting an NBA visit. Do we have Paul students? <laughs> ah. So splendid. Uh, I would like to congratulate you for excellent work this year and a great attitude, very constructive. Je voudrais aussi remercier les, les représentants étudiants et tous les étudiants qui se sont engagés aussi dans des activités extracurriculaires, des associations qui ont pris des, du temps pour ça, qui ont pris des, des risques aussi et qui ont fait beaucoup pour la communauté euh, au collège. Euh, beaucoup de gens ont été remerciés euh, aujourd'hui, mais pas encore vos professeurs visitants qui euh, donnent beaucoup de, votre, de leur temps et de leur énergie pour vous. Donc peut-être un petit euh, round d'applaudissements pour les professeurs. Et, et, et je voudrais aussi remercier les, les assistants académiques Paul qui ont été super, qui ont survécu à tout, et même à la dégustation d'escargots quand on était en study trip à Strasbourg. Donc, petits applaudissements pour nos assistants. Il m'avait mis au défi de prononcer le mot escargot pendant mon discours. Ok, euh, passons maintenant au prix parce que tout ça a déjà été très long. Donc cette année, le major du département Paul est Vincent Doshi. <applaudissements> Debout Vincent ah. This is a surprise. Hmm? <laughs> okay, now we'll, we'll announce a number of thesis awards that don't necessarily go to Paul students. The first one is the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry Association Prize <laughs> for the best thesis on a subject related to health or public policy regulation trade impacting the pharmaceutical sector. And the, uh, the award goes to Zoe Bertrand.
Now I would like to announce the two prizes, the Sir Julian Priestley Memorial Awards. They are very important to me because uh, Julian Priestley was a very important person in, in European integration. He was uh, 10 years the General Secretary of the European Parliament and he was a, a teacher in the Paul Department for the course on the EP. And when he passed away, Jean Schoens, his husband, has created two awards for, for you students. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, my dear friends, so the two prizes are the first one, best thesis on European policies and strategy goes to Matida Hutchings. <laughs> and <clears throat> the best prize, uh, uh, the prize for the best thesis on European institution goes to Richard Cunningham. The next prize is the ESC Award, you're supposed to know what it is, for the best thesis on the role uh, uh, of the actors of the civil society in the European decision-making process, and it goes to Elena Perez Velasco. The the Energy Community Award for the Best Thesis on European Energy Governance will be announced in Natalin tomorrow. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, the European Court of Auditor Audit uh, Thesis Award for the Best Thesis on a topic related to the work of the European Court of Auditors goes to Marco Zeppi. The European People's Party Group Award for the best thesis on the role and contribution of the European Parliament and its political group to the European integration process goes to Michele Pimpinicchio. The Jacques Delors Prize for the best thesis on a subject relating to European project goes to Julia Fernandez Arribas. Le prix, le prix de la ville de Strasbourg pour le meilleur moyen, mémoire sur la démocratie et l'intégration européenne va à Lennart Lunemann. The Transparency International EU Prize for the best thesis on the European Union role in anti-corruption effort, transparency, integrity, and accountability of the EU institution goes to Sören Schneider. And... <clears throat> Finally, on my side, the Merck Sharp and Dumb Best Thesis Award in EU Health Policy in an Ever Closer Union goes to Georgia Castiello. <laughs> so, congratulations to all uh, of you, and again, you will be remembered as a great promotion. And now there is a musical interlude. And later, uh, Professor Stuhl will come to announce a number of prizes on behalf of the IRD department. Thank you. The music will come later. <laughs> so, uh, congratulations also from my side. I'm trying not to speak as fast as Olivier. Um, but, yeah, uh, I will start with... Um, the most important Oscar um, for the study program of EU international relations and diplomacy, supposedly cocktail sipping Club Med. <laughs> but I will tell you a secret. Before IRD was created, that was the name of another department, but I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> so, 
the laureate, the best student uh, of the program this year is Emily Oudart. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, then I have two special prizes that are linked to language courses because they are an integrated part in the IRD study program. So the first one is the Goethe Institute IRD German Language Prize. And it's a very nice prize because it's an intensive language course of 10 days this summer in Berlin including accommodation, cultural program, excursions, etc. Uh, Professor Schmidt is also here if you have questions afterwards. And the prize goes to Christine Nagy. <laughs> then, then we also have prizes for the French courses. Le prix de français RIE APFF pour les, les meilleurs étudiants pour chaque cours de langue de française. Donc euh, la classe de Christian Hanou, c'est Thomas Balache. Okay. <rires> uh, la, la classe de Dalimo Tomic, c'est Adriana Cirvaci. Dans la classe d'Anne-Françoise Cunet, c'est Giulio Petrillo. Et finalement, dans la classe de Thierry Altmann, c'est Seneb Umerbeck. Et encore, um, there's a top-up for the best of all of those I have mentioned, uh, which was an additional cash prize, and it goes to Adriana Again, so. <laughs> so uh, we're moving to the thesis awards, so specific topics, and the first one would be the Sergio Lopez Perona Memorial Prize for the best student, uh, the best thesis of a student on the EU's relations with the Middle East. I have to say that Sergio was an alumnus of the IRD department for, who worked for the EU and passed away much too early and his fellow students sponsor every year a very nice prize uh, in his memory. Uh, the winner will be announced tomorrow in Natalin. <laughs> Sorry for the suspense. Uh, so I'll move on to the ENP award for the best thesis on the European neighborhood uh, policy for the British students. Um, which goes to a very topical and policy-relevant thesis entitled Feeding the Future, a Comparative Foresight Analysis of Food Insecurity in Egypt and Libya in 2035, Lucy Then we have the Georgian Institute of Politics Award for the best thesis on the Eastern Partnership, and which is also a cash prize or an optional research stay in Tbilisi. And we have a representative here today. And the jury said that this thesis stood out apart by linking the theoretical framework, global context, and Eastern Partnership problematics and assessing it in a policy-relevant way. The title is unlike minded partners, limits of the US and the US economic leverage to curb democracy deficits in the respective neighborhoods by Eva Stranadova from the politics department. <laughs> right there. Uh, then we come to the European External Action Service Award for the best thesis on EU external relations. It's a paid internship at the EAS this year, uh, considering to the extent possible <laughs> the winner's preference regarding the assignment within the service. And we also have representatives here uh, today. The EAS jury, it's a whole team, um, told me that the prize goes to a very forward-looking piece of work coupled with a very coherent plan for articulating his or her ideas and topics. 
and a thorough analysis of the EU's current and potential role based on an interesting framework of analysis. So I don't know if that tells you anything. But I can give you the title of the thesis. It's an analysis of the European Union's capacity to act in the Arctic by Stanislav Chouillet. <laughs> Then we come to the Union for the Mediterranean Award for the best thesis on Euro-Mediterranean relations, which is also a paid internship at the UFM Secretariat in Barcelona. And it has a very hot topic as a title, the EU hydrogen policy and the challenges of new interdependencies by Marco Valenciano from Politics. <laughs> Okay, next is the prize by Juno Christ, that's the United Nations University uh, here in Bruges, for the best thesis on the EU and global governance. And the winner can choose between a cash prize and an internship, a paid internship at Juno Christ. Uh, the title is, what are the legal challenges raised by the global expansion of the European Union model of geographical indications by Alexandre Lejeune from Law. <laughs> Congratulations. And finally, uh, a very new award that is given for the first time this year is the United Nations Award for the Best Thesis on Europe, Multilateralism and the UN. And uh, the winner will be offered a paid internship at the UN office um, in Brussels. Um, and there also, there's a representative here uh, today. And uh, the title of the thesis is Labor Rights and GSP Plus Assessment of the Effectiveness of the GSP Plus vis-a-vis -vis the ILO Conventions by Lucas Fernandez Corredor. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, yeah, I wish you all the best for your future. The future is yours, so really uh, make the best of it, and keep in mind that human intelligence and emotional intelligence is still more important than artificial intelligence. <laughs>
Dear colleagues, dear students, and family and friends, it is the very last time I can call you students because when you leave the ceremony, most of you will be alumni. So it takes me great pleasure. <laughs> it takes me a great pleasure to call you students for a very last time. Many congratulations to all of you here in the David Sassoli promotion. You have done a tremendous job, and I'm sure that you will leave the college almost a different person than the person you came to the college to, if only because you have made new friendships. You have learned a lot, not just academically, but also socially. So congratulations to you all. Um, specifically for the law, department, and I'm here as the director of the law department, but you will have seen, of course, you all learn to be critical, that it's not because it says that the directors will give the prizes for the students in their departments, that that is necessarily so. So we want to keep you on your toes, right? So when I will call the names of the prizes, it will not necessarily all go to law students, okay? But now let's come back to the law department. Hier, nous avons eu le conseil académique où nous avons délibéré les résultats. Ah oui. So I'm sure that before we call the prices, you would like to know a little bit about the appreciation that the department has of specifically the law students. Very briefly, you have been a wonderful promotion you have been a truly exceptional promotion. And already from the very first start, the feedback I received from all the professors was that this was going to be a very memorable promotion, hardworking, dedicated, intelligent. Et c'est aussi ce qu'on a vu hier, sans donner naturellement les résultats individuels des étudiants, 
I have been at the college since 95 in different capacities, since 2003 as director of studies. But it is the promotion in all those years that has the highest number of excellent. So a big hand to all of you. C'est ce qu'on appelle un très bon cru. But I can assure you that it is not because the professors have lowered their standards. We see to that. It is truly because of the work and the effort that you have put in. So I'm sure you're all curious as to your end results that will be given to you tomorrow. So today we're here to celebrate and to give the prizes on an individual basis. Mais avant qu'on fait ça, je veux quand même aussi appeler certains noms qui ne sont pas mentionnés sur le programme, but people who have been very important in the running also of the law department. Also the student initiatives, and I think for instance of the annual law conference, where unfortunately I couldn't be, but where some of you students made very good presentations. And also that the feedback that I received afterwards was one of admiration of the work and the insights that the students of this year's promotion had been able to put to the table. So, big hands also for all of you. Mais je veux aussi ici nominativement mentionner quelques personnes qui vous ont encadré tout le long de cette année académique. And I will ask everyone who is named to stand up, turn around, remember the very first day, you turn around, but this time you also look up because we have a big audience also sitting up there who would probably like to see your smiling faces. So, first of all, special thanks to the law team. The law team of assistants, so if you can stand up, law team. We have Celia, Julia, Julien, Georgia, Luis, Eriketti, Laura, and also Jeanne Forelea, together, of course, with Professor Garben. Professor Garben, also rise, please. And I believe not with us physically, but following us online is Valerie Houseby, who has done a lot for the organization. Also, very special thanks to your student representatives in law who have been working with us all along this year in a very constructive, sometimes firm, I must say, <laughs> but very constructive manner. So, if you can please write, rise, turn, and look up. Zoe Bertrand and Philomène Bocanfuso. And then some other students that I would like to name because they have taken part in student competitions of very high level and did very well as ambassadors of the law department or within the law department. And we start with our annual ELMC, uh, not uh, ELMC, we keep that for last. We start with the annual moot court of the law department with a winning team in the role of Advocate General was Marina Alcaraz Ortega, Miguel de Moral Sanchez, Mikael Dioca, Konstantinos Vitulkas, and Mikael Himmelsbach. And the best pleader award, you will all remember, went to Eamon Arbuckle. The Cassin competition, which took, which took place in Strasbourg au mois de mars, our team did very well. They ended up the fourth out of 38 teams, so that is a very good result. So please stand up. Our team in the role of applicants, Nael Leites, Angelica Restori, and Mustafa Obzun Yalsin.
And we have the ELMC team, European Law Moot Court team, who did also extremely well this year. The team went very far in the semifinals in uh, Bucharest. So the team, please stand up, turn around, and look up. Tully Eiling, Bertrand Zoe, Lejeune Alexandre. And I'm sure that you all are aware that this year, the college team also took away the prize at the final in Luxembourg in the name of uh, Ziegler. Lena, Marie, please stand up, turn around. Who was our commission agent. Now, Let's move to what we are paid to do, to give you the prices. <laughs> okay, the prices in the law department, the laureate of the promotion is this year. And how do we determine that, to keep the suspense a bit longer? <laughs> we do not ask all the professors or all the assistants or I do not handpick a student. No, it is the best overall average mathematical choice. It says between brackets. So that is the way we proceed. And it goes to Eamon Arbuckle. <laughs> Turn around. The Rafael San Rodrigo's Memorial Prize, which uh, is awarded by his spouse and alumni of his promotion, for the best thesis in the law department, again, mathematical choice, uh, mathematical calculation, uh, I would need to say, goes to a thesis that was written under the supervision of Professor Christian Mestre, and goes to Alexandre Lejeune. The Best Friends Award for the Best Thesis on Competition Law in the Digital Age, sponsored by Bonelli uh, Eredi Papalardo, Bredin Pratt, De Brau, Blackstone, Westbrook, Hengele Müller, Slaughter and May, and Uria Menendez, so they grouped it all together, goes to a thesis under the supervision of Professor Nicolas Petit, and goes to Beatrice Valente. <laughs> As every year, the prize for the best thesis on competition law and policy attributed by our research center, the global, uh, the GLC, the Global Competition Law Center, will be attributed at the annual conference next year. And I'm not at liberty to tell you who that is. So we keep the suspense a bit longer there. <laughs> we move to the link latest prize for the best thesis on the economic analysis of European law and the winner is a thesis written under the supervision of Professor Damien Gérard and goes to Sylvia Terzuli Galli. <laughs> the Mayor Brown Prize for the best thesis on competition, regulatory or trade matters goes to a thesis written under the supervision of Professor Isabel Van Damme and goes to Iman Arbuckle. <laughs> the Tussiat Award for the best thesis on EU enlargement policies goes to a thesis written under the supervision of Professor Wolfgang Wessels, who is not a law professor, but a politics professor, and goes to Roberta Wewska. <laughs> and we also have a prize 
for the best law ELEA student, the Ruben Perea Moleda Memorial Prize. And this goes to Silvia Terzuli Galli. Now, I wish you all the best for your future careers and also your future personal lives. Keep in touch, do drop us a line, or just pass by and come for a cup of coffee. It's an open invitation. Fare you well. Thank you, director, the colleagues, the students. Um, I mean, I would like to take the opportunity today uh, just to congratulate you uh, for the journey for this academic year. I really would like to give a, a special congratulation to uh, the ECO students, uh, because as you, you may know, I mean, the ECO students are the most valued students in the entire college. Uh, why is this so? Um, as you probably heard, they managed to survive to econometrics, uh, they managed to survive to modeling, uh, from what I could read in the yearbook, they managed to survive to my many graphs. Uh, so it's, um, it was quite an exploit. And um, as you may also know, I mean, the credo in the economic departments is anti -clomed. Uh We only allow a uh, climate uh, twice a year when we go to visit uh, the port of Zeebrugge. I heard that many of you uh, did appreciate it. Um, so that's just, just um, to underline it. Uh, that being said, uh, I just would like to say that uh, we are a small department, but as you could see today, I mean, uh, we had a finance minister today. Um, so just to say that economics matter, uh, and by the end of the day, you need to pay the bill. So it's very important. Okay, uh, so that being said, I'm going to, uh, to give the awards. Uh, so the first award uh, goes to the laureate of the ECHO department, uh, so the student who got the best marks. I have to say that this student was co-laureate uh, of another prize, uh, the Solve Your Business Game. And I'm very happy uh, to have Purdue Hadias to stand up. The second prize is the Laxon Velax Gesellschaft Award for the best thesis on EU state aids and EU public procurement, and it goes to Sophie Orton Laxa. <laughs> Congratulations. So the third prize uh, is a Martin Sawyer Memorial Prize for the best thesis on a topic related to economics and finance. And it goes to a student in Natalin. Um, so, I mean, uh, we will have to wait to get uh, the name of the student. And the last prize uh, is the one I ate, to be honest, uh, because I have to say it in Italian. My Italian is awful. Uh, so I ask the Italian student just to forgive me. Okay, I try to go home. Uh, so as a prize of the Dipartimento Italiano Politici Europee de la Presidenza del Consiglio dei Ministri. And it's for the five best Italian students. Okay. <laughs> Well, I know. I mean, I, I need to make progress, but from year to year, uh, I don't manage. Uh, so the first uh, prize goes to uh, Guglielmo Finotti. <laughs> the second prize goes to Francesca Romanelli. The third prize goes to Alexandra Stoffella. <laughs> the next prize goes to Benedetta Morari. <laughs> and we also have Silvia Tatsuli Galli.
Okay, so just to conclude, uh, the last prize is not just a program, but I really would like to, to give a special prize uh, to the ECO team, uh, so the three economic assistant, but also Eva, our secretary. Thanks a lot. So, uh, on behalf of the European uh, General Study Programme, so, um, it's a great pleasure and honour to announce for the first time the winner of the Stefan Zweig Thesis Prizes, uh, supported by the Evans Foundation, and we hope that this is just the beginning of a long tradition. So, the Stefan Zweig Thesis Prizes award a thesis open to interdisciplinarity, and related to one of the other two overarching topics that are the precarity of European values and peace and the unity of European versus nationalism. So, uh, on behalf of the entire EG program, I would like to thank warmly the Evans Foundation for their support and to congratulate our three winners so the first prize uh, award the thesis on EU federalism and EU charter human rights towards the highest feasible level of human rights protection in the European, uh, European Union, and the prize goes to Anche Medicevic <laughs> from the Law Department. The second prize goes uh, to a thesis uh, entitled Practicing What You Preach, a critical assessment of the effective implementation of gender mainstreaming in the European Union's common security and defense. And this is for Matilda Schulenberg. And the third prize uh, award a thesis on the evolution of systemic trust, a preliminary assessment of macroeconomic indicators impact on the feelings and trust in the EU institution. And this is for Flaminia Bonani. Voilà, merci, bravo à tous les lauréats, et comme euh, mes collègues, je veux aussi euh, m'associer euh, à leur remerciement et dire euh, au nom de toute l'équipe euh, IG, des profs euh, IG également, vraiment, euh, de la vie de tous, la promotion Sassoli est une super promotion, n'ayez aucun doute là-dessus, ne changez rien, et bonne route The Master of Arts in Transatlantic Affairs, or MATA, as many of you know, is a two-year program in which the students spend one year on each side of the Atlantic. For the students that are completing their first year here at the College of Europe, I would like to thank you and congratulate you for your first year and a job well done. You have much to look forward to, including writing that thesis with two supervisors. So there's that. But we are here today to honor the best, the best student from the MATA program. So this is a student that was here in Bruges last year, but I did note that it would be very interesting for her to check out the live stream. So she is watching. So please help me honor the best student from the MATA program, Cecilia Perez-Weigel. And we also have the Monte Best Thesis, the Jan Olaf Haushauer Memorial Prize for the Best Thesis on Transatlantic Affairs. I only had to make the one email, so again, it is Cecilia Perez-Weigel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Good. I have no awards to give, if not a collective one. Uh, no, this is not seriously an award. This is just uh, uh, some closing words uh, for this uh, uh, remarkable experience uh, you have shared with us. Uh, you have been uh, an extraordinary promotion. Uh, I have to say, with the patron you have had, I had no doubt about this. I think he has guided you through this year, and he will continue to guide you through your life and career. Uh, with a sense of uh, purpose, uh, humanity, uh, and solidarity, and justice. Uh, this is uh, uh, the end, I would say, but as I said before, this is not really the end. This is a transition towards a different chapter of your life that opens up. Um, Professor uh, Govare mentioned very precisely that uh, most of you will become alumni tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, you will always be a part of the college family and the college community. Actually, I think that it's today, it's tomorrow, that you really uh, become part of this larger network. And um, uh, indeed, uh, uh, this lasts forever. Um, I was a couple of weeks ago at uh, the anniversary dinner uh, of graduates that graduated 50 years ago. Uh, so uh, probably some of you will be coming back to Bruges in 50 years to celebrate your friendship, uh, your careers, your life, and also looking back at what uh, started here uh, in terms of uh, different life paths. I, uh, I don't have a speech for you, but I have uh, uh, some few words. First of all, uh, a big thank you from my side. Um, I've spent uh, uh, a lot of time with you, not as much as I would have liked to, but I really enjoyed uh, the conversations I had with you individually in my office, at the margins of conferences, events, uh, national weeks or days. Uh, um, just crossing each other in the street when I was buying milk in the supermarket, whatever. I really love that. And I told you, sometimes as a little secret, but I think that uh, I can say this also in front of our director of studies, our professors, our staff. This has always been the best part of my day and of my week because the interaction with you, uh, trying to pass you not only the knowledge but also the confidence and the sense of empowerment is the reason why we're all here and uh, you make our days, and I would always be grateful for that. I told you in the very beginning, and I was really happy to hear this from one of the speeches, uh, in, in the opening ceremony, uh, to take the words of Sassoli uh, in mind, not only for this year, but also for the future, and especially one message that he passed to uh, one of the previous promotions when he was addressing uh, the college students. Uh, it was times of pandemic, so it was done online. But he said, don't be elite, be leaders. And I think that you have done exactly this during this year, and I'm confident, I'm sure, that you will continue to do that uh, as of tomorrow and next month and next years, uh, trying to use this element of empowerment that knowledge gives and that the college, I think, gives even more. Not only through the knowledge you have acquired, through the self-confidence you have acquired, through the wisdom and the capacity to judge critically events and sources and informations, but also through the power that your network gives you. Um, there was a Twitter today that was saying that uh, what gives you more sense of power? Um, <laughs> being a, being a, stu a student in Bruges was among them, and I think it's, it's quite fair. It's not about power, it's about being empowered and use that power that I hope we manage to transfer to you. And it's not money, it's not status, it's really knowledge and the capacity to try to understand what you believe is right and do it. The minister uh, told you uh, something that I uh, told you several times. Um, I, I guess that I've uh, uh, shared with you, with so many of you, something that probably has shocked you a bit or traumatized you a bit because I've seen at least already three or four of you already coming back to me with the same sentence. Uh, um, uh, if you wake up six o'clock in the morning, the alarm goes on in a November rainy morning, what is it that you imagine makes you happy to get up and get to work and get to do what you do. Well, use that parameter. Do something that really you love to do, but also do something that gives you a sense of purpose. Do something that you believe is the right thing to do, to contribute to a better life of others, a better community, a better European Union, a better world. It might sound naive, but it's not. 
it's not. Because at the end of the day, the world is made of people and people count. And so what I would like to tell you today is uh, uh, do what you have done during this year at the college, also in the future. Be leaders, feel the empowerment you have gained through your own commitment, your own engagement, and through knowledge that you have, you have acquired and network. Do what you like, but also do what you believe uh, is right, uh, taking the courage that Sassoli had all his life. Uh, keep in mind always uh, the uh, mission statement of the College of Europe that is uh, uh, now your mission statement, uh, that is contribute to the European integration and to good relations with our partners. The world and Europe desperately needs that. You heard that from the minister. Keep that in your heart, in your mind. Um, that that is somehow the legacy that the college gives to you to be the ambassadors of the contribution to uh, the integration of the European uh, continent and relations to our partners. I think now you're ready. You're ready to go uh, out there in the world, uh, all uh, of you with your path of personal, professional uh, development. I also think you're probably uh, ready to go party uh, for a nice reception. Uh, a last word I would say to your family and friends and parents, um, you can be proud of them. Uh, I, uh, you might have missed them, you might have uh, supported them even when it was very difficult, it was worth it. They're really good, you heard them, that from uh, some of the toughest professors that are around in Europe. And if they say so, and if even, even Guido says that, this is for real, <laughs> for sure. Enjoy and congratulations. And uh, I, I hear declare the academic year 2022-2023, the Sassoli promotion closed. Sorry, this is not yet time to go. Stand. But as in all European uh, events, we conclude with something you should know very well.